Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Today's virtual forum will discuss response and recovery efforts to the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. To begin, I'd like to express my sincere condolences to all of those who have lost loved ones during this crisis. And to those fighting the virus, we're praying for your full recovery. The pandemic continues to pose significant challenges for uh, local communities. Along with the coordinating disaster response efforts with federal and state officials, local communities must continue to deliver essential local services. Local officials are also the closest in proximity to families affected by the virus. Additionally, in New Jersey and where elsewhere, uh, the pandemic has exposed pre-existing problems in the way our country cares for our elderly and veterans. These pre-existing problems have left those living in facilities like nursing homes, nursing and veterans homes, more vulnerable to consequences of the virus. The virus also disproportionately affects minority and economically disadvantaged communities. In New Jersey, the state of New Jersey has begun taking steps to reopen local, uh, reopen local leaders uh, and with local leaders will have to continue to support frontline workers and be on the lookout for potential outbreaks. I'm very concerned about the uh, reopening uh, too quickly. I still think that we need to proceed with caution, but um, each um, state and local government is moving on what they see fit. Uh, the federal government must also uh, do its part to help state and local government, state and local leaders recover from the crisis. And now I'd like to recognize Congressman Cedric Richmond from Louisiana uh, for his opening statement. Well, I'll, I'll start where you uh, started, Don, and that is to uh, express my deep uh, condolences and sympathy for those who have lost loved ones or who have loved ones going through it, or they themselves may be going through it, uh, just to say that we are praying for you. We are uh, here to help, and uh, we just wish uh, wish you the best during these trying times and to our uh, frontline workers, and I mean everyone from clerks at the dollar store to our nurses and our doctors and uh, everyone else who has been going to work while the rest of the country was shut down, which was very needed. Uh, thank you for what you do, and uh, you all are true patriots, and it is not going unnoticed. Uh, but here today, we're to talk. We want to talk about uh, the response, and we're in a unique situation, both New Jersey, but more importantly, um, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, as we uh, will see. Uh, are predicted to see a higher than normal uh, hurricane season. And so when we're uh, asking people uh, for social distancing, isolation, uh, the question becomes, how do you do that? If you have to evacuate, how does the landscape change in the world? So we are still pushing for those vital elements. And I think the federal government has to take the lead if we're gonna open this country up safely. And that is to make sure we have the testing, make sure we have the ability to trace, and we have the ability to isolate people all, all while, I believe, maintaining some sort of case management with each person who we know tests positive to see their needs. Because if you don't have a place to isolate, if you are a struggling uh, person that just wakes up every day supporting your family and you are living a two bedroom apartment, uh, the question becomes, how do you safely isolate? And I believe that as a government, we have a responsibility to deal with things the way they are, and not how we want them to be. Too many of the people in this country are living below living wage or having to struggle to make ends meet and be at a disadvantage. Last thing I would say that <clears throat> is partly where uh, you mentioned, which is we have to take care of our vulnerable communities those African-American communities, those minority communities, those seniors who are in senior homes and nursing homes that are devastated by coronavirus. And we have a number of those in Louisiana, whether it's our 
Southeast Louisiana Veterans Home or Lambeth House, we are taking the brunt of it and we owe our seniors uh, more uh, than what we're giving them. Uh, they, their blood, sweat and tears made this country uh, a more perfect union and we should respond accordingly and take care of our veterans who risk their lives for our protection. So with that, uh, I believe we have a very exciting list of panelists and we should uh, go and hear from the experts. So with that, I'll yield back Donald. And uh, I think you're on your mute. Point. Excuse me? No, go ahead. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, uh, to your point, I think um, it's very important to understand that um, in these minority communities, when, um, when this country gets a cough, the African-American or minority uh, communities get the flu. And so I was not surprised by the uh, outcomes uh, that we were seeing. Um, our most vulnerable populations are the, the least healthy and have more of the issues um, that uh, were susceptible to this disease. And uh, so I was not surprised at all. Uh, you know, I go to dialysis three times a week, trying to be very cautious um, uh, being out there and exposed. So um, I understand what it, what it is to um, be a part of that vulnerable population. And we need to keep our, um, keep our eyes on that and continue to work. Uh, we need to help all Americans. But I'd like to welcome our panelists for today. Um, Lieutenant General retired Russell L. Honore, uh, Director Greg Kearse, and Detective Sergeant Michael Capadano. Uh, Lieutenant General Honore served in our country's military for over 30 years and was the former commander of the Joint Task Force Katrina, leading the task force's response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Director Greg Kearse is the director of the Jersey City's Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. There he directs the agency's coordinating efforts with federal, state, and local entities on emergency management and homeland security issues. Detective Sergeant Michael Capadano is the supervising officer for the Essex County Office of emergency management. Detective Sergeant Capadano has been in law enforcement for 24 years and has experience working large scale disasters such as Hurricane Sandy and Irene. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, I'd like to start with questions um, for you gentlemen. Um, what types of challenges uh, are all of you seeing in the response of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll start with uh, General Honore. I'm issues with you today. I too send condolences to those who have lost their lives and been uh, and lost their jobs in some cases from this pandemic. But uh, to the question of the hour, uh, I think we had a bad start. Our, uh, our government uh, didn't do what uh, we promised it was going to do after 9-11. We created the Homeland Security Department, put a lot of money in there, put a lot of organizations together to protect our homeland. Uh, through many reasons that have been played out on television, uh, the system didn't work. Uh, we uh, had a slow start, slow in terms of recognizing that this the dangerous nature of this pandemic and we had indecisive decisions made uh, by the task force in the white house that slowed our ability for homeland security and all the federal partners to do what they need to do to defend the homeland so uh i do have some recommendations on what need to go but i'll leave it there uh, for the other gentleman to make comment but i do have recommendations on what we need to do in the future Thank you. Director Kears. Yes, thank you, Congressman, for uh, allowing me this opportunity to uh, participate today. And once again, um, just uh, God bless all of the uh, souls that were lost as a result of this horrific event. 
I, I think one of the things, just what General Andre had to say, is it was the overall federal response. It seemed um, FEMA, when it was a standalone agency, in my opinion, was a lot more effective. Uh, I think now that they are part of the Homeland Security, uh, around the Homeland Security umbrella, uh, it just presents more layers of bureaucracy than when you have to deal with it. I think one of the biggest issues that we all dealt with countrywide was uh, the uh, PPE, the personal protection equipment that was uh, people were literally screaming for in hospitals and in public safety agencies. And I think FEMA must be in, a, in what they referred to as a push mode as opposed to waiting for assets requests to come up from local state governments. There was enough information out there prior uh, to the pandemic hitting uh, the United States. And um, I think that they were a little slow uh, in reacting to what information that was coming in from overseas. Thank you. Um, uh, Sergeant Capadonna? Sure. So uh, first off, let me start by saying on behalf of Sheriff Fontura and County Deputy Joe DiVincenzo, uh, we want to thank you for putting this together. And, uh, you know, this is extremely important for us to go over. Uh, as, as you are all aware, New Jersey, uh, and especially Essex County, has uh, seen their fair share of this. We are, uh, our death rate is, is very high, and our toll across the whole community in Essex County is, uh, is tough. So I, I agree with Director Kearse. The initial issue we had had was getting the PPE out to our first responders and to our healthcare uh, partnership here whether it was hospitals or long-term care facilities. And we had an issue uh, where they needed certain gloves or masks, and we were unable to get them initially. And it was very, very hard. And, and we're now finally starting to catch up. But the initial wave of this that came, uh, it, it hit us hard, very hard here in Essex County. And Essex County has been, in my opinion, doing very well in getting their stuff together uh, with when it comes to testing, uh, you know, I think we are on the forefront, and uh, the county exec and the sheriff are 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 really moving forward to try and push this ahead. Uh, and I think we're doing very well. But again, at the beginning, we had a hard time getting the equipment that we needed in order to perform the tasks uh, that that we're doing now. And, you know, both the. Um... County executive and the sheriff succumbed to the um, virus at, at one point in time. So uh, it's really impacted um, everyone across this nation, even leadership um, in our in our home communities. Um, I'll go to uh, Cedric Richmond for a question now. Well, let me thank all the panelists. In general, uh, let me publicly once to thank once again thank you for. Uh, bringing uh, strategic common sense to uh, the New Orleans area after Katrina and Rita, and when you stepped on the ground, it made a, a big difference. And so with your experience in logistics, your experience in uh, the military, let me ask you what is the question at the moment right now. With the predicted overactive hurricane season, with both New Jersey, New York, the Gulf Coast, all uh, susceptible to category anything from you know, two to four or five, which would wreak real havoc. What are your suggestions for protocols or how do we go into hurricane season best prepared to come out of hurricane season with the least amount of, of loss and fatalities? Uh, that's it. And the, and the season is upon us, and with active season, as you said, I think we need to uh, do some uh, quick reorganization of how we respond to hurricanes. Right now, the federal government wait for the governors to call them and say they need help. Now, that makes no sense. We need to uh, look at the hurricanes coming, uh, create regional commands. We used to have six armies in the United States. Uh, Congressman Richmond. Uh, and their job was to do land defense in the United States and respond to hurricane volcanoes, you name it. Uh, we're down to two armies in the United States now. Uh, and only one of them focuses on homeland security. That's uh, Army North in uh, San Antonio. I think we need to regionalize that army 
And uh, when hurricanes are coming to the islands, we need to have the navies and the marines follow them in so we can immediately go into life-saving support, whether it be Puerto Rico or Virgin Islands or any other territory. We need to stop messing around waiting for the governor of Puerto Rico to call and say they need help. Help, we know they're going to need help. Why we keep playing this game? Hurricane Harvey, the governor there refused to ask for help. Finally, eight days later, he asked for help. They sent a ship. By the time the ship got there, they had to turn around and go back in response to a Hurricane Irma in Florida. This is making no sense how we responded. The purpose of the military is to save lives. They can put the National Guard, which are under the command of the governors, uh, immediately when the hurricanes start to come with the vulnerabilities we have, we got to have a good evacuation plan. In Congress, Michigan, we've got too many empty hotel rooms around America to still put people in hot gyms. The evacuation plan need to be set. People need to know what towns they're going to, and we put them in empty hotel rooms. We don't need to treat people like third world because they have to evacuate. Use those hotel rooms. Get them set up now. Because putting people in a crowded gym sometimes with no air conditioning, sir, that's what we evacuate people to. Let's get our evacuation plan because if people know they're going to go and be able to keep their family safe in the hotel and not have to spend any money out of pocket, that needs to be fixed. But evacuating people to gyms and old uh, uh, warehouses is stupid. And we need to stop that practice across America. We need to get the hotels ready, wherever they are in the region, and tell people where they're going to evacuate. We need to organize the regional command with uh, Army North and NORCOM working with FEMA and have helicopters maneuvering on the storm, have ships maneuvering on the storm. We keep playing this old last century game like we did in Katrina. Wait till the hurricane comes. We knew it was coming in as a four or five and wait for the governor to ask for help. What the hell are we waiting for? Because the next day, what are we waiting for in Sandy? We waited for days. Then we had to get National Guard approval so they could uh, go on Title 32 status. What are we waiting for? People are going to die. The quicker we get there, we can help save lives. But the model we're using now and the cumbersome chain of command with the um, with Homeland Security is stupid. We have put the St. Bernard along with the Rottweiler. Why does FEMA inside of Homeland Security need to be reloaded? It serves no purpose. It need to be working for the president. And I know that may not be what you want to hear, but they're in the life-saving business. Right now, we need to get this fixed, but for hurricane season, sir, I do recommend that we pull hard of Homeland Security to collaborate with the Department of Defense, have the National Guard days a lot of, so each governor can mobilize without going to have to pay for it on Title 32 and create these regional commands and tell the military a mission. You maneuver on these damn storms. Your job is to defend the people of the United States. We have not done this and we're reluctant to do it on the COVID response. We need to be there to support the government and the National Guard and save lives. But give them a mission, not a mission assignment. That's what I got to say about that, and I appreciate you giving us time to give that answer. Thank you, General. I yield go back, Donald. Oh, thank you. Uh, and and um, Director Kirsch, you raised an issue um, COVID-19 really exposed us to the shortages uh, the nation's supply chain for personal protective uh, equipment and uh, really other, other equipment. The federal government and the states uh, really had to scramble around to secure goods. Um, General Honore, do you have thoughts um, on how the federal, state, and local governments should have evac uh, evaluated uh, the need for PPE? given the short yes, that everyone is facing now? Yes, sir, just a short answer. First of all, the stockpile wasn't maintained uh, in the last three years, number two. Uh, the early on intelligence reports, which I don't have access to intelligence, I only go by what's in the news, clearly indicate we should have started ordering PPE early on based on the estimates and based on the, on the health assessment. Uh, 
when you fail to get a good risk assessment out of Homeland Security, working with HHS and CDC. And then when we did respond, we used an entrepreneurial approach. We started talking about supply chain. You know, the government, we don't use supply chain. We use damn logistics. Mm. The difference between supply chain, that's what Amazon do. You wait till a customer order it and you have the capacity of the issue. In logistics, you acquire, anticipate, and push forward based on your estimate of what people are going to need. That's what the government does. But they came up with this smarty stuff out of the White House, trying to be cute, trying to come in. Well, we're going to use supply chain. What the hell is that? We don't use that. We use logistics in the government. That's why we have war stocks. That's why we have stocks of medicines and, and, and other things in the government. That's why we have days of supply of MREs. The next thing they, they fail to use is logistics in terms of days of supply. They were talking about, well, we need a thousand masks here. We need a million masks here. No, it's days of supply. They totally fail on the logistics order because they got confused. The other thing is they created the bridge and the bridge would allow planes to come in primarily from China. Then they broke down the supplies, and then every state was uh, bidding against each other for those supplies. That is totally, it's illegal to do that. We have to force the states to be able to compete against private companies, which got some of the supplies that the government flew in. Well, I'll defer to other people, but I really got a lot of heartburn on how that was executed. And hopefully we never do it that way again, because under the Homeland Security EFS, Emergency Support Function, we have modalities for getting all of this done. Through FEMA as the requesting agency from the state of feeding that into the government, and we did not optimize the Defense Logistic Agency. We put this task force team together, and FEMA have done their best, but you got to understand, they started very late responding. Yeah, plus, plus they were at the behest um, uh, in my capacity as the chairman of Emergency Preparedness Response and Recovery. FEMA comes directly under my purview, and um, in dealing with them, I I got to uh, hear a, a back kind of message to me that you know their hands are really tied by the White House, so their efforts were um, were noble and in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to work at the behest of the White House, who was cutting their response every single day. Director Kearse and um, Detective Sergeant Capadano, uh, do either of you um, have concerns about the specific personal protection equipment uh, being supplied to New Jersey? And uh, do our first responders in uh, communities have enough PPE? So uh, I'm gonna, I'll let director take the lead on this and then I'll, uh, I'll be more than happy to follow up. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, well, we do, Congressman. And, and as I say, stated earlier, FEMA has to be in the push phone. As, as the general had mentioned, uh, you know, there, there, is, there was significant information and intelligence that was coming in regarding the COVID uh, situation. And, and once again, it didn't appear that they acted as swiftly as they could. You know, the, the thing that's concerning is that much of the PPE supply is uh, manufactured in Asia and particularly in China. And uh, I think what happened too, when uh, there was a, the events originally had occurred, originally had occurred in the Wuhan province, uh, much of the PPE that may have been destined for delivery to uh, the United States was uh, placed on hold. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do in Jersey City uh, based on our uh, UASI status as a core city. Um, we were monitoring these situations as, as early as December and, and built a, a fairly reasonable cache of uh, PPE. So our first responders, uh, police and fire and uh, EMS were able to advantage themselves uh, to have uh, a supply of it. And I can tell you this, we have been continuing uh, to build on that supply as uh, we move forward for uh, preparedness, should we have any additional events. Sergeant? So, yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm in total agreement with, with the director. Uh, again, Essex County is in the UASI region. We are part of them. 
And luckily we are, because we were able to house uh, PE initially. However, that ran out very, very quickly, right? Uh, it turns out we didn't have enough on hand. You know, we were a little bit unprepared for this. Uh, however, you know, through this, we were able to get more equipment. But the issue that we're having was initially a lot of this equipment came from overseas. Uh, we were told it was equivalent to N95 masks, which are made in, uh, in the United States. And it turns out that they're not. So we're handing out equipment. And we're telling hospitals and responders and ambulance companies uh, that it should protect you as well as the stuff. Uh, turns out it's not. And uh, these are things that are coming through. The, uh, from the FDA and the CDC that we're finding out later. And that, that, that is very, very concerning. Absolutely. Uh, I'll yield to uh, Cedric Richmond. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, one thing I will add to this is that, um, you know, the importance of testing and the ability to know who has it, uh, who had it, uh, is very important, especially to local governments as they continuously try to fend for themselves. The other question is how this is hitting minority communities. And one of the things we're, we're finding and that we knew all along is that, or many are finding we knew all along, is that uh, income inequality and poverty is a chronic disease. So when you start talking about food deserts, banking deserts, pharmacy deserts, uh, areas of the country and a lot of rural areas also where people just don't have that access, uh, it becomes a problem. So part of the question is, how do we uh, address that in a sense of uh, economic security uh, in the country? Because studies have shown that those communities that could afford to uh, isolate when the suggestion was made by the government uh, they fared better because they were able to stay at home. And communities where people did not have the same economic wherewithal, they continued to go to work because they didn't, they didn't know where, how they would pay their bills if they didn't go to work. They didn't know that the federal government would step in and uh, provide relief because it wasn't a mandatory stay at home. And uh, that economic uncertainty um, Hardworking people continue to go to work so that they could provide for their families. And far too often in general, I think you know this, that in poor communities, uh, especially in the black community, if the parents have to work uh, and the kids are off of school because we closed the schools first before we mandated that people stay home, you just bring the kids by the grandparents' house. And that's the last place you wanted them in COVID-19 world. So I would ask all of you all, how, how do you see the economic inequality or income inequality in the country exacerbating where we are in uh, this particular crisis? In general, as you answer that, uh, I would also ask you about uh, env other environmental factors that I know Tulane and both Harvard mentioned as uh, exacerbating uh, the risk to vulnerable communities. So uh, whatever order you all want to answer, and thank you, I know it was a long question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick. On the last question, it's been clearly demonstrated that uh, through other means before COVID, that our community in Kansas Island between Baton Rouge and New Orleans uh, are, uh, don't have good health outcomes. You're expected to live about 10 years younger if you live in that area and you live in the shadows of these plants. What uh, the Harvard study showed was uh, the particulates, P2.5, which get into the lung, fine, fine grade pollution, uh, destroys your airway and deteriorates your uh, breathing capacity. And when it hit St. John Parish, uh, it, it was devastating. And again, it shows, and because they could see it from using satellite imagery, the, the impact in that area, then on top of that, the death tolls start to show up in that area, and it, 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 it links the dots one to two that it reconfirms the impact of pollution on, on our people health. The uh, other piece on testing, the initial guidance on testing, 
I know of talking to people, being very active in this for the last few months without anything else to do, staying at home and answering phone calls and email, people would call me and they couldn't get a test because they didn't meet the CDC guidelines. Mean they were walking and talking. They were not necessarily old enough or sick enough and they hadn't been around anyone and they hadn't traveled. So a lot of people that should have been tested early on were not tested. Exactly. But we all saw what happened. Let's talk about what needs to be done, if you if I if I may. I think we need a system of what we've termed TTIT. Test, trace, isolate with support, meaning if you uh, come up positive, we're gonna put you in a place to stay so you can isolate. That's support. And treat. We want to see about you and make sure you're treated while you're isolated. If we don't uniformly do this around this country, we will have a 50 state solution, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We need a national testing strategy with logistics to get the kits to people, with the money to support isolation as required. If we don't do that, we've got a we've got a entrepreneurial approach in lieu of a national strategy and national logistics. You know what? It's not working out fine. We're not testing a million people a day, or some suggest two million a day. We need to test. We're a big country. The other thing is Plan B. Talking to some Harvard and Brown professors and 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 uh, academics is that we need to divide and use a color code or whatever we want to as terms of categories, a code of red zone, like what's going on in New York, still a pretty hot area, a yellow zone, a pretty neutral, you on the way down or you've leveled out, uh, and then a green zone. You never got there. Your medical system never got stretched. You don't have a lot. And then use testing protocols a focus on the green and the yellow and make sure the red has all the resources they need. Uh, we need a plan B. Was actually the plan A we got is 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 not organized and it's leaving up to the states to figure it out. That's the purpose of the federal government is to create the SAS strategy, create the resources, create the procedures for the, how these tests be done and make sure they are done properly and we've got the data and we can track, trace, and isolate people with support. That's my recommendation, sir. Thank you, General. Anyone else? Uh, sure, yeah, I just so, uh, uh, like the comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so uh, real quick, uh, as, as you're all aware, uh, Essex County, uh, New Jersey, is uh, pretty much a hotspot. And when, when you're talking about um, uh, people in a condensed area, Newark, of course, uh, has that that uh, spiral effect that we have here. So Newark in itself has over a third of the deaths uh, and the um, and the cases in in the state, right, or at least in the county, right. So Newark is a big hotspot here. Uh, which also obviously is, is a minority uh, uh, town or minority uh, city, as, as you're aware, Congressman. So I, I think from our point of view, what the county exec and the sheriff has put together is a pretty good model, right? We are testing the majority of people within the city of Newark. We have testing sites open three days a week within the city of Newark. Uh, and actually it's five days a week with, with uh, between us and the city of Newark itself, between the county and the city. So, you know, when it comes to being a model, you know, I think we're doing a pretty good job here. Could it be better? Yeah, listen, there's always room for improvement. Uh, but I do agree with, we need to do something here uh, moving forward to correct some of the wrongdoings, or I don't want to say wrongdoings, that's maybe not the right terminology. Uh, but this right here is a preview of potentially what's to come. Right, so this is a test case is what we're going through now. Who knows what's in the future? But I think it's time now that we really need to put our heads together and, and figure out how to move forward here and uh, and, and make this better mo moving forward. Director. 
Uh, yeah, just to echo what uh, the general and sergeant said, what uh, our Mayor, Mayor Fulop had, had early on decided that we were going to do testing uh, both the uh, uh, at locations throughout the city, uh, uh, two locations. We were doing it initially seven days a week. We're now moved into the mobile testing where we're taking the entire operation through uh, different areas of the city. I mean, one of the things that's concerning when you, it was mentioned about our minority population adversely affected, that's very true. I mean, it's the problem you're having is Jersey City is one of the most densely populated cities in the country. Uh, you know, we have people, multi-generational homes living in crowded areas, working in the service industry that jobs cannot be remotely done and needing to use public transportation. So, yeah, I, I think that the fact that the testing moving forward is, is the best barometer we have in the contract tra tracing to ensure that, you know, we're on around this. Um, you know, there's no information coming out that there's going to be a vaccine readily available. So, um, you know, I, I believe, although we have to start opening up, uh, you know, the cities and, and the states, we have to do so very cautiously because uh, a second round, a second round of this uh, could be potentially devastating. Donald, can I ask a real quick follow-up? Uh, uh, to what you just mentioned about service industry employees and their need to use public transportation, are you all doing anything special to protect your uh, transit employees, uh, either bus drivers or uh, subway drivers and those who work in those uh, facilities? And then what are you doing about other essential workers in terms of I know as the federal government, we've not given you any help on hazard pay or anything like that. Can you talk about what you're doing and the need for more assistance so that you can help those people who are on the front lines, but they're not wearing gowns and treating patients. They're making sure that we can open back up. Well, I'd like to comment on it. And one of the big concerns we've had too is, especially for this type of event, um, is the mental health issues that our first responders are dealing with. You know, this is this is unique in itself, uh, whereas we had a, you know, we've never had a, a, a national event like this. This has been ongoing, obviously going. Obviously, we have a hurricane, we have issues like that. It, it comes in, it goes, and then we move on. But this is a 24-7 operation where our EMS and our firefighters um, and, and uh, police officers are responding to it. It was a recent, um, uh, survey that was led by the Conference of Mayors. 92% is 92% of the cities in the United States have inadequate personal protective equipment. Going back to what we said before, um, you know, I, I think they workers have to be financially supported so they don't have to work multiple facilities to make ends meet. I could go on and on with this, but I think the what we really should be looking for in addition to hazardous pay is is a support mechanism to deal with the mental health issues our first responders are facing today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that, thank you. That was a uh, very good point uh, that you made. Uh, and, you know, um, you know, uh, Cedric, in response to that, you know, with, um, I knew that you were going to be in trouble in, um, in New Orleans and Louisiana. Uh, based on the, uh, the, the the mutual shape of uh, our demographics, and um, knowing that New Orleans um, um, or Newark mirrors a lot of the population in New Orleans with the same issues, um, I knew that it was trouble coming to a lot of major um, population centers in in the country. Uh, the 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 frustration for me was the response of the federal government of FEMA. And, um, you know, when they initially opened their, um, their test sites um, that they supported in New Jersey, they were in two counties that did not have the, the, the major population centers um, uh, represented. So in my district, I have the two largest cities in the state of New Jersey, and there was no FEMA uh, no FEMA response to either one of those communities. Subsequently, as the sergeant says, Newark has the largest rate of death in the state, and I could not get FEMA to open up a site in Jersey City or Newark. 
and it was just very frustrating, the response. Um, we continue to fight to keep them um, supporting the, the two sites that they are supporting now. They continually want to move out, but I think we were able to push them back in there. And, um, you know, with that, we're coming up on our time, and, um, you know, I will defer sure, to the Sure. Colonel Payne, I think we need to raise the conversation. Uh, one to resilience. Uh, this this uh, epidemic, pandemic, I don't think it was a surprise, but we're going to have to figure out better in our government all the money we're spending uh, in Homeland Security to keep people from crossing borders, which is primarily what they do. Uh, yet this pandemic came in on airplanes uh, and ships and other ways. We need to raise the elevate the discussion to resilience. We know if it's a storm, a flood, or a blizzard, and in this case, a pandemic, the most vulnerable population are the elderly and the poor. We need to stop uh, messing around uh, and wait until this become the headline news. Katrina, what was the headline news? Poor people that did not have the means to evacuate, they didn't have the credit card to call for a hotel, they didn't have a car to get there, and the government didn't provide the transportation to get them there. We need to be, to be stopped being surprised when a disaster happens that the majority of the people that's going to die are going to be the elderly and the poor. In Katrina, over 90% of the people that died were elderly, poor, and disabled. Yep. And we found yep. them dead by themselves. No surprise. We knew after Katrina that the city was locked down that the city within 10 days didn't have the money to pay to pay their workers because when the cash registers closed, now all of a sudden people in Washington, some of them are figuring out, well, the states need money. Yeah, they don't have money because they've been closed 30% of their revenue. So I said, I tell you that we need a resilience plan that people understand and the Congress hold those government agencies accountable for that we can be resilient. We can pop back. You know, once the nursing home in, in Washington state was violated and the one in New Orleans, where were the state governments and the federal agencies? Hey, nursing homes is a very dangerous place. Let's get in and nothing happens. We look at the nursing home industry to block themselves from local governments and their lobbyists, and we lost a lot of grandparents over this bullshit. Well, thank you. I think that is a... Good enough comment to end on. Um, Director Kearse, do you have any final um, comments? No, just once again, uh, thank you, uh, Congressman, for allowing us the opportunity to, you know, to get this information out. Um, you know, we all hope and pray that, that at some point this will uh, mitigate, they get a, 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 a vaccine where, you know, uh, people will be able to go back to, uh, I guess, the new normal, as you want to call it. Thank you. Sergeant Capadano? Sure, real quick. So, um, yeah, listen, I think the country is going to get through this. We're all going to get through this. And it's because of leadership uh, like like you all, like the Congress that are on here, that are really pushing forward and trying to make this better and to seeing uh, where the shortcomings are and, um, you know, to, to fill those plugs where they need to be filled, right? Uh, but this is another show of where the UASI region uh, and the funding that's coming in is is really important. So again, I want to thank you on behalf of the sheriff and the county exec uh, for inviting us here. And uh, we're here uh, if, if you need anything there, Congressman. Uh, thank you. Um, and um, Congressman Richmond, any last thoughts? I'm just going to once again thank our panelists. Thank you, Diane, for convening this. And just remind everybody that uh, this was a colossal failure of federal government. Uh, we didn't harp on. Uh, who knew what, when, and what did they do with the information? Because there will be an appropriate time for that. And that's after we uh, safely reopen the country and we protect uh, our citizens from home way. But let me just publicly uh, say to the general, who I know is going to call me and give me an earful when we're over, because I kept touching my face, that I do have my hands sanitizer here. <laughs> my hands are clean. So, uh, so hopefully I've saved you uh, that chastising of me. But... Uh, on a serious note, we just have to remind our people to be very cautious and safe, and that is to protect yourselves, uh, wash your hands, wash your hands, keep them out of your face, uh, wear masks out in public, 
And uh, it's an inconvenience, but it's a necessary inconvenience. And thank America for what we do. And there's no challenge that we've ever faced that we've not, not overcome when we stick together. With that, Congressman Payne, I yield back. Thank you. And um, communities across the country have been affected by this uh, pandemic in cities and towns are responding in real time. Uh, to Congressman uh, Richmond's um, point, uh, the federal government has uh, must do more to support communities across the country to respond and recover from these crises. And um, General Honoré's point of resilience is one that is well taken and understood and needs to be the mantra moving forward. And uh, your understanding of these issues, particularly local perspectives, helps our um, country develop effective response and recovery. So thank you again for joining us. We're grateful uh, for the time site. With that, I will close today's forum. Thank you to everyone for watching and joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.